My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Friday, September 13th, 2013. I'm interviewing Tracy Rabbit in Pryor, Oklahoma as part of the Oklahoma Native Artist Project sponsored by Oklahoma Oral uh, History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. As in the Southwest, we have our own tradition of artist families in Oklahoma, which includes you and your father, Bill Rabbit, who passed in April 2013. And while your art and life have been deeply intertwined with your father's, you've always put your own unique stamp on your work, and you're continuing that family legacy. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. You're welcome. Where were you born, and where did you grow up? Uh, I was born at Claremore, Oklahoma, at the Claremore Indian Hospital. Uh, grew up at uh, Cherokee Nation Housing Addition, but located between um, Locust Grove and Pryor. And you have some uh, siblings, right? Yes, I have a younger sister. She's two years younger than I am, Kim Inyert. She lives in Colcord. She's got two kids. Then I have a younger brother, uh, Billy Rabbit. He's eight years younger than I am. He's got six kids. <clears throat> what was your relationship with your grandparents on either side? Um, and I, I also want to say I have one more brother, Stephen Proctor. Yeah. He's actually a cousin, but he lived with us, and he's a brother. Um, relationship with my grandparents, I would say, was closer on my father's side because we lived closer to them and had a very good relationship uh, with them. On my mother's side, um, it was good. It's, it's, it's a long, intertwined, different story. But, yeah, when we did see him, yeah. Were you the only one of the siblings that was a uh, children that was interested in art? Uh, I think both my both my sister and brother are talented in, in their own right. My sister is a very talented writer. Uh, she loves to write poetry, but she's uh, very involved. She's a nurse, and she uh, my nephew has spina bifida, so her time is very limited, and, and uh, her calling is a little bit different. Uh, my brother he enjoys uh, line drawing more of a, I guess, a tattoo art style of work, but <clears throat> he's busy with six kids. So I, I believe each of us had a talent. Um, as far as I'm concerned, from an early age, I, I was just always my dad's shadow. Whatever he was doing, I wanted to do too. <laughs> um, what were your opportunities um, like in prior to be around Cherokee language and culture? Um, from a very early age, my mother could probably tell you the story better than I could, but uh, Cherokee was one of the first languages that I spoke. Uh, the, when my mom was working, my dad was working another job. Um, our babysitter, which that's what I still call her today at almost 44 years old, um, that's all they spoke in the home. And of course my dad's father was uh, fluent in Cherokee. Um, and as you started school, you kind of, you lose that. We're now Cherokee Nation. It's it's awesome because they have the immersion classes. But uh, yeah, I've been around the Cherokee language all my life, and, and still know quite a few words. And yeah, and and the more you're around it, as anybody knows, you start to remember it. It's it's in the memory banks, right? For sure. Oh, yeah. that's great that you had that experience. What is your first experience of seeing Native art? Oh wow, I think my f hmm, my first experience. And really realizing that that's what I was looking at, I would have to say first grade, um, because I vividly remember painting a painting which I, I wish I had. My mom may have it somewhere. I won a first place ribbon in first grade, and it was uh, I remember it was a couple of teepees, a snow scene, um, had snow and a sun all in the same painting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was aware of it aware of it then. Of course, my dad doing what he did, I was very fortunate to be around a lot of, lot of well-known um, artists and exposed to not only his work, but um, traveling with them. I, I, I just can't say how blessed I was. Yeah, I could go on and on about all the different artists that I've known in my life and still know. What was your first experience of making art? The very first experience I remember was um, I was laying in the floor at my grandmother's house and like I said we grew up in a housing addition so all the aunts and uncles we all lived very close proximity. Uh, I remember drawing on the back of a brown paper bag 
laying on the floor behind the door. Um, and I vividly remember it was winter. And I had actually, uh, there's a white buffalo. My grandma had a brown one. And I had that buffalo on the floor and I'm laying there um, sketching that buffalo. That's the, and, I, and I couldn't tell you how old I was, um, but that's when I really first remember drawing was on that brown paper sack. What kinds of art experiences did you have in primary and secondary school? Not a lot. Uh, when it involved, unfortunately, <clears throat> in the prior school system, which um, just for a short time I went to Sepulpa, I think a half a year in first grade because my mom was in the hospital for a very long time, so dad just moved the family up, up to uh, Sepulpa. Um, Unfortunately, in the prior school system, we really didn't have a lot. We had art, class, art classes per se, but it was mostly probably teachers volunteering their time. Um, I hope it's better today. But, um, yeah, not, not really a whole, whole lot. Um, even when an artist's work sells well, you know, artist children a lot of times don't have access to the same material things as their peers. And I was wondering how aware you were growing up of sort of the uncertainty of an artist's livelihood. Of my dad's career? I would say I graduated high school in 1987. <clears throat> and dad started showing his work at the art market, Linda Griever in Tulsa. Um, late 80s kind of started getting his stride really about the year I graduated um, as far as growing up before that I can't exactly remember the date uh, when my mom encouraged him to just jump off the bridge at sink or swim time um, I never knew doing without anything uh, he uh, him and my mother both whatever they had to do whatever they had to sell on the side as a child you didn't know that but as an adult you hear the stories so i never really knew any different um they never let us kids know we never did without um and i never felt like i lived in the projects per se um but as an adult you learn that that is where you lived and sometimes kids can be cruel uh, but you you tend to um, make your skin a little bit thicker I guess as I graduated college then I started re realizing the reality of the financial impact of what he did and I had to do um, a paper and my degree was in business administration and that's a whole other story why i didn't take art at nsu um but anyway um so i decided to do it on artists as a profession and i learned during my research um, that less than one percent of artists in the united states make their full-time living as an artist and i felt that my dad was um, a great example of that because my mom helped him she wasn't working another job while he was doing full-time art, art. She helped him matting, framing, traveling, doing everything. So they were a very cohesive unit. And I learned that that was um, unusual. That's really when I would say the realization of what he did and how rare it was uh, that he stood on his own two feet and that he had an awesome woman that backed him to do it. So I know that they did without a lot so that we could have yeah. did you get involved with the sort of business of art you were already then in college I guess as a teenager you didn't have much to do with the family business of art oh no no I started working at the studio when I was 12 oh good tell yes. me about that uh, my dad's first studio was um, at the end of a convenience store he rented the building and it wasn't too far from Cherokee Heights and I, I remember vividly being, I was a, right at about 12, about what my, what, what my niece is now. And my first job was I had to learn how to stretch canvas. And we would be out in front of the shop on the sidewalk. 
and he told me, he said, sis, now if you're going to work here, because he always treated me like an employee, and I guess being the oldest child, I was the experiment, because my sister being the middle child, she seen me get in trouble, so she would sneak on by. My brother, eight years younger, they were just tired, <laughs> you know, and he figured it out real quick. So I was the experiment child. But anyway, I was on the sidewalk, and I remember this so clearly. He said, you know, if you're going to work down here, and like I said, he treated me so serious. If you're going to work down here, you need to know every aspect of this business, and you have to start from ground up from cleaning the bathroom, sweeping the floor, and today we're stretching canvas. And I remember because he was, uh, and it was a big canvas, and he ran the staple gun and the, no, he had the pliers, and I did the staple gun. So he would pull down the canvas, and I would do the stapling, and then he had the hammer. So my job was the staple. So, uh, no, I've been involved in, in that end of the business. Then, then I went to shipping and receiving. <laughs> shipping and prints, and... Uh, after that, it was learning how to, of course, my mom did the matting and framing at that time, but yeah, no, I've been involved in that business end for quite a while. As an employer flunky, as mom says, <laughs> yep, I was the gopher. <laughs> did you enter some of the youth art competitions as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, uh, the first one that I remember would have been first grade and the, the local things that you had at your school. And then I entered student competitions at Five Tribes, won some awards there. Um, I'm not sure if I, I think I was out of high school or right out of high school when I entered the Cherokee uh, Museum or Heritage Center in Tahlequah. Um, Trail of Tears show, what are you talking about? I can't remember if it was Trail of Tears. I don't remember honestly which one it was. I just remember I won an award. I was over the top. I mean, it was probably like second or third, but I mean, I was just like, why? Wow, yeah, that was great. And, but the best thing about that show that I remember, and I made a copy of the check, was that Wilma Mankiller was chief at the time, and uh, she got to go in and of course view the show, and she purchased my painting. Oh, and I remember making a photocopy of that check, and I have it somewhere, because that was the first big piece that I sold. Yeah, I was on, on the top of the world. I thought that was just the coolest thing, because that was like getting a blue ribbon to me, having her, the first female chief, buying a piece of my art, and I thought that was pretty all right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. You competed for the title of Miss Cherokee in mm -hmm. 1988. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that experience like? Well, it, it, w it was a good experience. It really was. I, I competed twice, me and a, a friend of mine, uh, right out of high school. We both were down at NSU. And the first year, I think I got second. I'm, I'm not really for sure. And the funny thing is, is for talent, I did a painting, and that's kind of hard to convey up on the stage, you know. So I did a painting that had a story behind it. And I remember, which I'll say no names, but one of the ladies on the committee, she said, that's just not going to work. And the funny thing is, is that's what I ended up doing as a career. But it was a great experience. Um, I wanted the scholarship money. Um, and then I got, uh, I think it was Miss Congeniality or something, and my sister later told me, she said, when they gave you that award, she said, I was sitting in the audience with mom and dad. She goes, they don't know her very well, do they? <laughs> something a sister would say. It was so funny. But yeah, it was a great experience, yeah. So do you feel like in anything, uh, it played into your art experience in any way, or your? Uh, the pageant part? Mm -hmm. Or the competition, that competition aspect, I guess, of public? Uh, I, I think maybe it it helped as far as getting out in the public. But, you know, and that was another thing where my dad pushed me really hard. We would be driving, uh, driving down the road and he would be interviewing me in the car, pretending that he said, okay, sis, and this would happen numerous times. Um, I'm gonna be the buyer and I'm going to start asking you questions and he we would role play going down the highway um, as far as getting up in front of the public and learning how to speak better of course you're an Oki and the Oki starts to come out but um, yeah I would say it it opened horizons for me in the fact that I got to meet a lot of different people that work for the tribe and those connections I still have today. And the girl that actually won Miss Cherokee, I mean, we're still friends today. She went on to be tribal council and just a great person. So yeah, 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 it, it impacted me. And you got your degree in business management, as you say, at NSU. 
Um, can you take us through your thinking on that? I sure can. Um, I started college when I was a senior in high school. I had completed all of my courses and they wouldn't let me graduate early. So they let me, at that time, it, it um, now they do it all the time, but um, they let me go ahead and start college courses my senior year. So I was going to RSU. So by the time I started college, and I was just 17, I, um, I was actually one of the youngest ones in my class when I graduated high school. And I had decided to, to go to NSU, it was close to home, <clears throat> and I was still traveling with mom and dad. They would fly me to like Santa Fe Indian Market, so I wanted to be close to home. Um, so I go down there, I enroll, 4.0 student from high school. Um, first semester, they're coming at you. <laughs> um, I just thought it sounded really funny. Anyway, um, and they want to know what your major is, so they're uh, assigning you, um, it's not a counselor, but the person that signs your, I can't think of the word now. Advisor. Advisor. So they assigned me an advisor. So not knowing what I wanted to do, I said, well, I want to open an art gallery or something like that, I guess, you know, just put something down. So I was assigned the advisor, uh, the head of the art department down there at the time. And so I have to go and meet him. And he says, so what do you want to do with the rest of your life? so on and so forth. And I told him, I said, well, uh, open an art gallery, work for my tribe. I'm, you know, I'm really undecided. This is my first semester and, or I may be an artist one day. I have no idea, you know, just full of hope and dreams at that age. And he said, an artist, what do you, what do you mean an artist? I said, well, um, I like to paint and I have sold a few pieces and maybe I'll paint one day, you know, real naive, and he says, well, that will never happen. He didn't know about your father. Well, that's the rest of the story. And I said, <laughs> he didn't know, uh, he didn't realize how unafraid I was to stand up for myself. And I told him, I said, what do you mean it will never happen? And so the conversation went downhill real fast. And even though I was 17, when it comes to certain subject matter or my dad's career, I can be very boisterous and know my facts on that. And I said, I can name you five artists right now that make their living off their art. And he said, well, who are they? And boy, I named off, bam, bam, bam. Of course, my dad being the first one. He said, well, I've never heard of Bill Rabbit. And I said, well, I'm surprised. So, of course, <laughs> I changed my major that, literally that day, I walked over to the, uh, the bookstore and got the book of degrees and I flipped through there <clears throat> and I thought okay I'm reading the different degrees I don't want to I, I'm not a teacher I'm not this I'm not this <clears throat> I really don't like science all that much business administration computers so I just kind of start reading through there. tax accounting that okay I can do this um, that would help out down at the shop help my mom out I mean I literally this was this was all in one day uh, bought that book um, set out my plan and every semester it'll have laid out what classes you should take. I was my own advisor for the five years. I never darkened that man's doorway again. And that's how I ended up doing business administration all in one day. Come home that evening, of course I'm telling my mom and dad, he said, well, what was that guy's name? I told him the name. He said, well, that's funny. I just met him a month ago. He hung my 30 year retrospective show at the museum. I said, well, he told me he didn't even know who you was. So anyway, that's my uh, how I decided what degree <laughs> to get in college. <laughs> that's an amazing story. But I had a plethora of artists that, that Dad was friends with, and so I had all these teachers that when I asked them a question, I, I, was a, a, I felt privileged because they would share their information with me freely. Can you name maybe one or two artists that you particularly admired or that you could talk to in that way? Oh yeah, uh, Ted Miller, Charles Pratt, um, at that time probably Ben Harjo, um, Ben Shoemaker, um, Bob Annesley, um, there were so many. I mean you just think of that group that was at the art market, I mean all of them, Troy Anderson, I mean and even to this day, um, you know, Donald has been awesome since I lost my dad. Donald Van. Yeah. 
and he's invited me down to his studio to, to sit with him and, and to learn and um, and I'm, we had talked about doing actually some uh, some neat educational interviews with him while he's here. I wish I had done more of that with my dad. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I can name a lot, a lot. Um, so when you had your first, was one of your first gallery shows at the art market with your dad? One of the first shows you did in a gallery? No, actually, one that I that I recall like, in a gallery setting, probably would have been Doris Littrop's gallery. Okay. Uh, Mom and Dad were off at a show. I was just newly married, and uh, I went to Oklahoma City. I think I had maybe four, four pieces, and they were more of a woodland style of work. Um, yeah, and I, I, I remember being there by, by myself, which, you know, me and Dad seem like a team, but um, that would have been the very first one that I vividly remember. So uh, she was having a group show and yeah. you brought in four pieces. Yeah, she was having a group show. She asked me to be in it. Dad couldn't be there. I think he may have had some pieces there. I don't remember, but they were out of state. And so that was probably, uh, probably the first one that I can recall right now. Yeah. And then after that, it just, when I, when I got done, when I got done with college, Dad, well, I was in college, he said, I want you to graduate. That is your priority right now. And while I was in there, probably about my third year, I, I actually thought about working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs because I've always enjoyed keeping up with tribal politics and different things like that. Uh, but I continued to paint, and he would take my work uh, with him. And after I graduated college, that was an accomplishment. Uh, for my dad and my mom because I was the first one in my family to graduate college uh, that he was very proud of. He said, that little piece of paper says nobody can ever take away from me. As a matter of fact, I got it framed and it's over there on the, on the wall. I keep it down here. That is cool. What did you do then after graduation? After graduation, I <clears throat> that was about the time, uh, honestly, Everything works out for a reason. You come to a crossroads in your life, and I had actually looked at several uh, jobs at through Cherokee Nation, actually through my connections to the Miss Cherokee pageant, <coughs> talking to friends, and it was about that time that the um, uh, this is 1993 that the IRS uh, got a hold of my dad for about five, five years worth of audits. And it was meant to be to have my business degree. I stepped in immediately, um, helped my mom and dad line everything out. They had an accountant, he left the state. <laughs> um, but it was a, a good learning experience and, and I that was my jumping off point. I, you know, when you come to a crossroads, do this or this. And I felt like it, this is what I was supposed to do. I finished college and then I was supposed to come back and it all happened, you know, it was, uh, it was quite the experience that has affected me. That, that, that experience has affected me through my life, very much so. Um, so I, that's when I started taking over the paperwork, the business end, the accounting of it. And the very last year they were audited, which at the time I didn't know you should take an attorney with you. Me and dad went by ourselves. Uh, took all of our records and the audit was over in about 30 minutes and the lady says why are you even here uh, but I mean I had everything in line for them every receipt learned a lot uh, a, a lot of artists to this day I'm surprised uh, and we get hit up for donations for good causes all the time and organizations will tell you you can write that off um, an artist cannot you can only write off the cost of that canvas. The IRS does not care about your talent or what it would sell in the real market. Um, so it was it was a it was a good good learning experience. So that's when I guess my career as a um, accountant, <laughs> part time manager under my mom, <laughs> and then still painted on the side. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great combination to have. Um, what were some of the drawbacks of having a father who was a well-known artist? There's not many, um, but the one I will say is 
uh, I would I would say there's only probably one. <clears throat> you, you inherit not only the friends, but you inherit the enemies, even though you had nothing to do with the situation. And I would say that's it. Did your, what were the benefits? Oh gosh, those are numerous. Um, getting to experience art on a different level than just the average child, um, travel, having a really cool art collection. And my mom and dad were, not only did we get a piece of his art for birthdays and Christmas, they started our collection when, I would say we started getting like duct tape, Nevacoya originals probably about in junior high. So every year they made uh, a concerted effort. And it depended on who we liked. And Doc Tate was always one of my favorite and uh, Kelly Haney. So every year we, we would get a, another artist piece of work. Um, getting to travel. For see, a present, Christmas. For a Christmas present, yeah. I have a pretty extensive art collection. Um, and not only enjoying that piece of art, but also actually knowing that artist on a personal level. And a lot of kids, they, they're not afforded that opportunity. Um, getting to see different things, not only after a show set up, but all the work that goes in behind it, behind the scenes, because it's a lot of work. Um, gosh. Having a private teacher. Uh, you can take all the art classes that you want. And of course, you, you learn their technique and their style. And my dad being self-taught, he, would just jump in there and do it because nobody ever told him that he couldn't. So that was the kind of teacher that I had. And we would be down here at the studio. There were many a days being on the big easel behind you there, um, just having fun and experimenting. Yeah. And the benefit of just having exceptional parents. Did your father's collectors gravitate towards your work as well or did you develop a separate following or was it kind of a combination mm, I would say you know in the beginning maybe a little bit of a uh, little bit of a combination but not all collectors are going to follow what you do they'll encourage you and then there would there was one gentleman <clears throat> I, I had done a quite a bit of work for my first show at Indian Market with my dad and I was probably 2021 maybe and like I said you <clears throat> you should dad used to tell me you better develop thick skin fast he said I can open doors for you but I can't coddle you I'm not going to um, tell gallery owners and or collectors you will have to stand on your own two feet period and there was a <clears throat> one collector and I would say the person that I admired right out of high school, their work was Dana Tiger. And I remember being at Colorado Indian Market and looking down from the mezzanine at, at her booth thinking, she's awesome. And so I think that's what really inspired me to start painting Native American women. Well, I know it is. She was really, really the person. Uh, and, and being friends with her now, and, and I've told her this story. I said, I can tell you what you were wearing even that day. <laughs> and I just thought, you rocked. And uh, so, as far as collectors, I had one collector come up, and this was my, I, I would say, my first series of Native American women that I was trying to portray and trying to find my footing. And I think as a child of somebody that is well-known, you, you're painting what you're being taught, but yet you want to go in the total opposite direction so people can differentiate your work from your father's, the In the Shadow Syndrome. And um, the collector came up and said, uh, I just don't think those women are ever going to sell for you. And I remember at first thinking, wow, that's kind of mean, you know. But then it was probably the best thing that he ever told me because I made it a point from, from that show on that I was going to paint women's faces, not just the back of their heads, because some of my early work, it would just be the back of their heads. You know, and Dad would draw all these profiles for me on a canvas, and he said, "Okay, sis, I want you to start painting all these profiles," because that's what he mostly did. He was teaching me what he knew, 
And from that Indian market on, I thought, I am going to do anything but profiles. And I started just practicing and practicing and practicing and trying to get the color right and uh, different things. So it grew to where I had some people that collected my work because I was Bill's daughter. And then as my style grew and the, the more time you spend and you, you get better at your art, I started to have a collector base that didn't even collect dads. And so it's funny how things come full circle. Um, you start standing on your own feet and doing a totally different style, but yet the the hair was always what tied his work and my work together. Because I would say Dad was really well known for that long hair, and so I used that in my work. Yeah. So now I have my own collector base before he passed, um, to where they would walk into a show and people say, "Well, you know, Bill," and they would apologize to him. Yeah, I just really like your daughter's. Where he goes. She is a good buy. I am more proud of her. Um, you should collect her work because it's better than mine. She can paint faces way better. And you know that's a dad talking. But um, yeah, it it uh, yeah yeah it's it's a combination. It's a combination. And then towards the end, we did the collaborate collaboration work together. Yeah, yeah. And, and we'll talk about that here in pretty quick. Um, so when did you establish this Rabbit Studios here? In this building, I want to. Uh, this building, I think we've been here since 1990, I believe. Um, and then prior to that, Dad had a couple of other smaller studios. But uh, also open to the public, like a store kind of situation. Uh, I mean, they were smaller. Pu the public has always been able to come down. Um, but I would say this is a bigger location where we were able to do that. Yeah. <coughs> And whose idea was it? Was it kind of everybody's or your dad's or yours? Or? I was in college at the time, so I would say that was a, a mom and dad. Okay. He outgrew the studio by Kentucky Fried Chicken, pretty much. <laughs> um, and they were looking for a building, and this used to be a car, car shop. A guy kept his race car here, and it came up for sale, and it was, it was what they needed. Mm -hmm. And so we've been here since. Um, the Native art market got pretty tough after 2001 and a lot of artists tried to figure out how to write it out or still trying to figure that out. But I know that one of your strategies was reproductions mm -hmm. of artwork on smaller, less expensive items. Mm -hmm. um, how have those been important to your business? Very important. Uh, right after I graduated college. Uh, Dad was already doing calendars with a company in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, which was not always a popular path to follow, but when you got three kids and one in college, which I, my mom and dad paid for every ounce of my college out of their pocket. And that's something I'm very proud, I can say. From the sell selling of his art, he paid for my five years. Um, when I got out, he was already dealing with a company in Phoenix, Arizona. and. I'm not for sure really what uh, what it was that, that sparked the, um, doing the gift items. And, and like I said, I was doing my art then as well. And I believe the one of the last calendars that it was six of Dad's images, six of mine. And having, my dad was a very, <clears throat> very smart businessman. Um, he just had that innate ability to see both worlds. Um, so when I came along, got, got done with college, I could see a lot of opportunities in his work. So it was kind of the next generation moving forward, doing something more innovative and kind of out of the box, which he had already done that in his time by stepping outside of the boundaries of Oklahoma and expanding his market. Um, so an opportunity came along to work with the company and do um, contracts where they're producing your work and you get paid a royalty and one of the contracts kind of went sour and dad would do business on your word you can write up the longest contract that you want but if that person is not going to back it that contract doesn't mean anything learn that real early I don't care if you have an attorney or not <laughs> so anyway there was this uh, deal that kind of went sour and I told dad I said we can do that 
we can do that. And it was from that bad experience that evolved us starting to actually be our own manufacturer. And I told Dad, I said, even though it's not the norm at the time, why can't we do it? All we got to do is go buy some equipment. And we kind of set a goal. We started off small. And it went from, and at that time, everybody was doing limited edition offset lithographs. Um, I said, why don't we take these calendar prints and let's put a mat on them. They're printed on the same paper as a limited edition, the same thickness, the same printer printed them. Um, let's, let's put a mat on them. Let's, let's uh, appeal to a market of about $15 retail because most people at that time, and, and even today, will drop a 20 and not think too much about it. You get over 100 and they're, they're considering it. Um, so that's how that started. So we went from these calendars that everybody was buying to putting a mat on them, selling them, um, to doing note cards, to doing our own magnets, and it just kind of grew. And I think that's where the, the marketing or the business end that I enjoy so much, um, that, that's probably where it started. And I just, and, and I probably got that from my mom and dad, that can-do attitude. Well, if this company can do it, so can we. And so that's how that how that started. And when we started doing the tiles, we were one of the first artists that were actually producing our own tiles. Because at that time, R.C. Gorman, um, when Dad was named one of the top five investments in the United States, it was him, Amato Pena, I think, Doc Tate, uh, Donald Van, and there's one more that's evading my memory. Um, but everybody was doing licensing agreements at the time but nobody was actually producing. So we had the family backing with my mom and cousins that we had this support system. And my brain that sometimes my mom says goes 24 hours a day, and I was like, we can do this. I tell you what, I'd go see a product, and I'm like, we can do our image and do it this, and uh, we're already doing the wholesale shows with these manufacturers. Why not do our own line? And Dad says, go for it. And I did. I ran with it. But I always had supportive parents. And, of course, his images. And uh, it has just grown exponentially. But during the bad, bad times of the economy, when people aren't necessarily buying, you know, a $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 original, they will buy a $20 mad note card. Mm -hmm. So that filled in the gap. But it also created a whole new um, air of collectors that would buy these matted things. As you explained, you know, those kinds of small sales are important and they add up for an artist, but I know that you've run into some problems with shows mm -hmm. over that. Mm -hmm. um, some of the shows are, they are original only shows, which I respect, I respect the rules. The rules have been around a long, long time. Um, but from a next generation's point of view, and I look at my dad would always tell me, if you see somebody that's successful, whether they're an artist or no matter what form of business they're in, try to figure out why they're successful. So you look at McDonald's, Walmart, how Walmart prices things. So all of these things would come into play uh, for, for how we would do things. And I think my dad being a full-time artist, and when you support your family and your mom, nobody else is working a nine to five and bringing home a check or retirement disability whatever and all you have to rely on is the sale of your art and you go to a show and and you can only show originals and you're sitting there for two days three days whatever it may be and you're hoping for that one collector and in the back of your mind you're thinking okay when I get home I have a house payment I've got this uh, I've got two kids other kids still in school you know that part when you're doing it full-time it never leaves your brain Never. So when you're picking these shows, um, having all originals, it, it's great. You have to have those originals in order to have the reproductions. So yes, it does all start there. But you still have to pay the electric bill. And I think sometimes promoters of shows, or it has gone on so long, it has become a tradition. Um, and I, I feel personally that, that Native American and our art is as good as anybody's in the world anybody's but I think sometimes that the rules are antiquated um, 
and that Native Americans, we are smart, innovative people. They tried to kill us out, but they didn't happen. We've got strong DNA. So why can't we compete on a world market just like European art, European artists? Uh, so that has always been my mindset. So when you go to a show and you rent your 10 by 10, and my philosophy, or my argument, I guess, was if we're making these products, especially the reproductions, uh, we're cutting the mats, we're printing our own prints, we're making our own tiles. You can come down to my studio anytime and see the equipment that I use. You have questions, I'll answer them. Um, if you're supporting your family, cousins, and a lot of times uncles, aunts, uh, over the years, everybody is pulling together to produce these products. Um, why can't we not sell those? So those rules that shows, and I've written many letters <laughs> to Red Earth and different ones, kind of stating my point or my argument, because for them, that is a one-time show that they have volunteers and they do great job behind the scenes. It takes a lot of work to put on a show. And then you have cantankerous artists that come in and want to complain. And I don't want to be that artist. But I also know that on the economic side, that you have bills to pay. And that for those three days, you are there to sell, to conduct business, to be professional. And I've got three days to make a month's worth of money to come home and pay bills. And I, I think committees and people like that, they don't take that into consideration. And, and I volunteered, I said, I will come and talk to you guys and maybe you can see things. Or why don't you come to my studio? Because if I don't sell something here this weekend and at least pay for my booths and expenses, I'm going in the hole. And I still got the electric when I get home. So um, it has always been of my op opinion, uh, don't put your thumb on us, encourage us. Let us compete on a world market because we are intelligent, innovative people. And we, we have the, the gusto and the, and the know-how, especially the younger generation that's coming up they're computer literate and they are doing wonderful things with technology and they don't necessarily have to be a hand pulled item or a hand pulled print I think that we need to adjust with the times and and, and look at because there's only going to be one original only going to be one but let us compete on a world market with everybody else because we're just as smart and as good as they are and that's just been my opinion well, let's talk a little bit about when you and your dad began painting uh, collaboratively, okay. how that idea came about, and what your first project was. Uh, okay, first project. The first project, I would have to say it was a five-piece mural that we did. Um, they were building the new Cherokee Casino in Catoosa. And at that time, Taylor Keene was uh, the one in, uh, in charge of commissioning work for the restaurant, that's what it was. And he called me and dad up there, um, put on our hard hats. We got to go up there and see where what they were talking about, where it was going to um, be displayed, the subject matter that they wanted. And it was five 30 by 40 canvases that made one big original and we told him our idea he said go with it love it and the big easel behind you we actually extended the two by fours to hold all five pieces that was the very first first one that we worked together um, first of all it was a it was a very strict deadline and we needed both of us on it to complete the deadline to so that's kind of how the idea of collaborating came yes. about and I believe that Taylor had asked, could you two work on this together? That way we have, because they were trying to incorporate all the Cherokee artists. And at that time there was only so many spots of art that could be filled. And it was kind of a two for, a two for one. And uh, that was our, our first one. And after we completed that, it was, you know, I, and I've always enjoyed working with my dad, but it was such an honor to even be asked. Uh, yeah that was it was pretty pretty humbling i was nervous i was all of those things that yeah but that was that was the first one that five piece mural 
And it was what what subject matter? Uh, it was titled Spring Planting, and it was a, a Cherokee home place after the removal when they came to Oklahoma, um, and it it depicted something very similar to uh, my dad's grandparents' home, um, kind of rural Cherokee country. And how did you divide up the painting responsibilities? How did you? We divided it up into what we do best. Which was? Uh, Dad would, he would, he did, okay, I'm trying to think of the piece. Um, and I have it up front, a small tile mural gift item. <laughs> that one he, well, okay. Even on any collaboration piece that we did after that, we did what, what we did best. Dad would do backgrounds at that time. I am, I'm a detail-oriented person, so the big trees with all the limbs and things that he did back in the day, I started to pick up on that. Um, yeah, he would work on it a little bit. There was so much detail in that painting. I didn't want to paint a tree for years after that because I think we had, was it four, <laughs> four big trees? And you're, I mean, the tree is this high, and when you get, I mean, each, you know, you know the detail I'm talking about with your husband. So he was kind of roughing in the yeah, background, he, the landscape. Yeah, he would do the background, uh, the mountains, pad that in, how he would do with his sponges and different things. And then he would take a break and while he was done with his section, he's over here on the other easel painting other paintings, getting ready for other shows. Then I would come in and I would do a layer of my work. Then he would come in, it was kind of an alternating thing. Uh, there was a big scissor tail flying uh, bird in the sky. I would do the detail of that. So, it, there were, and there were parts of it that we both worked on. And then there were things that were just totally separate. Right. But yeah, it, it truly is a collaborative effort when, when we work together. Yeah, very cool. much so. Um, in 2006, you and your dad competed nationally, I think, to come up with a concept for the Trail of Painted Ponies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your dad had already done one, but this was one you did together. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit? Yeah, um, when that came about, it was called the Native American Art of um, Horse Painting, I, I believe was the, the theme of the competition. He had already done one pony titled Earth, Wind, and Fire. It was a full-size horse. Uh, they had asked us to submit a sketch. We were down here talking, and usually we would have our morning meetings at breakfast at Thomas's. And uh, I told him, I said, at Thomas's restaurant. Okay. It, yeah, we would have breakfast over there. And, that was uh, your. That's your routine. Studio that was, routine. That was our routine. We eat breakfast every morning over there. Talk about what we was going to accomplish for the day, what we needed to do. <laughs> we had a list by the time we got here to the studio to accomplish that day. And it was getting down to the deadline for the sketch, and I don't know if a lot of artists are like that, but I'm used to like right down to the deadline. Maybe it's an Indian thing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but we were having breakfast one morning, and, and the deadline was approaching, and they gave us this outline of the horse. And I said, you know what, Dad? I said, they're only going to pick 10, and we need to be different. So instead of you doing a pony, me doing a pony, because these sketches are flat. I said, let's put your design on one, my design on the other, and tell him it's going to be one pony where you paint one side, I paint the other. He's like, man, that is great, sis. So we get back to the studio, and I said, okay, the, the horse culture is mostly your plains tribe, so let's go that direction. I said, on your side, what do you think? You paint the male warrior or his version, what he's responsible for within, within that tribe. I'll do the female version on my side and when, and we still have the original sketches when we sent that in we were hopeful you know we wanted it to be different and we was approaching it as a collaborative effort um, there was over 400 entries international when they called they picked 10 and uh, we was one of the 10 and I was so nervous you know when you're doing a sketch and you're jumping out there you're like woohoo yeah let's do it and then when you get chosen you're like oh yeah now that's pressure so uh <laughs> yeah that was that was that was so cool and they sent us the horse and at that that time they were doing what they called maquette so they were smaller horse not a life size and um dad actually finished his side first i always let when we do collaborative i would let him go first and then 
then it was my turn to do my side and uh, I actually uh, worked on my horse quite a bit while he was in the hospital and uh, I, I would just bring my little paint table and uh, worked right beside his bed in the room. So that got finished very recently. Um, his hospital stays a lot of people. He he had battled Agent Orange. He was first diagnosed thirty thirty one. So a lot of people didn't know it was Agent Orange. I mean, he battled it for thirty five years. Mm -hmm. So when we was doing the pony, he would um, he was not in kidney failure at that time, mm -hmm. but he would battle respiratory uh, problems. You know, he's real prone to pneumonia. Right. So it, it was one of those days, you wow. know. Yeah, we, we, we got to where we called them slumber parties. And because uh, when he went in the hospital, I didn't come home till he did. Um, you were in a traveling exhibit, uh, I think sponsored by the Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian called Ramp It Up. Or I may not have that right, but it was yeah. skateboard art. Oh, yeah. And it sounded like a lot of fun. I wondered if you could talk about that. Right? Yes, uh, I was doing a show at the Smithsonian and I actually met this um, skateboard company, Native Skates. And uh, he was actually across from us, from our booth. And we got, you know how you are when you're at shows, you get to know your neighbors and you get to meet some, some great people. And um, I had one of dad's feathers hanging. I was trying to think if dad was there that year. Anyway, um, he said, you know, that would look really great on a skateboard. Are you open to that idea? And I says, I'm always open to neat, fun ideas. And uh, so that's how, how that came about. We was actually neighbors at a show. And uh, I think the skateboard idea was awesome. It was so neat to be represented. Yeah, they photographed that. And, and uh, Todd sent that to me through an email. You didn't show to it opening. We, but we they... weren't able to go at that time. And... Um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. As a matter of fact, um, we had a snowboard company, uh, like my dad's skeleton paintings, and they talked about doing that uh, on snowboards. Oh, wow. So it's really cool to, to and you know, that, that's what was neat about my dad is that he was multi-generational. He, he was always in touch with his age group, being a baby boomer, older people, all the way to the young kids on skateboards. And when, and when I told him, I said, what do you think about a skateboard? He goes, that's cool. He thought it was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember if you mentioned the name of that show that you met Todd at. Um, it was the Smithsonian Powell. The Smithsonian Powell. Yes. Gotcha. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your um, process and techniques a okay. little bit more. So how has your subject matter changed since you started painting? I think when I started painting, I did the, the woodland style uh, of my, basically of my dad's work because he was teaching me what he knew. Uh, from, from that evolved into um, more following Dana's work, like I mentioned earlier, because mm -hmm. I just thought she was awesome. Mm -hmm. And so I started painting the Native American woman. Mm -hmm. um, and then over the years, that really has been the, the main mainstay, unless it's a commission or something that we're working for Cherokee Nation. Uh, that then and now continues to probably be my passion because I had such a strong mother uh, figure in my life that told me I could do anything that I set my mind to. So I guess that's why I always admired Dana at the time because mm -hmm. she seemed to personify that type of a, a person. So I continue to, to paint Native American women. That's that's what I enjoy. How has your palette or ch choice of colors changed over the years? I would say in the beginning it was more earth tones, uh, doing the landscapes and the, the Cherokee old uh, home place settings. Um, to if I'm feeling red and purple that day, we're going to do red and purple. Uh, being around a colorful character like my dad, um, like I say, being self-taught, if he was feeling green, purple that day, he loved color. He just loved color. And that has obviously been a big influence on me. And I think that, um, I know personally when I walk into my home and I see my art on the wall, color makes me feel good. So 
if I'm able to, to create something that day and I'm feeling the red, hopefully somebody is going to walk into my booth and they're feeling the red and they like it and it puts a smile on their face. So right now I'm, I'm into um, starting to paint again, um, which has been a process. Um, so for Santa Fe Indian Market, that was, um, that was a big stepping stone for me because I applied for a booth on my own and uh, I was accepted. Uh, and when I That's felt, unusual I, for a first time. I felt, uh, I, yeah, I felt, uh, I felt my dad behind me all the way. Mm. Yeah. So <clears throat> color makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm the brighter, the better, as dad would say. <laughs> <laughs> And your primary medium is acrylic. Yes. On campus. Yes, I enjoy the acrylics. Um, I did take an oil class with Sharon Erlen. She was kind of laughing at me because, <laughs> which I love her work. Great artist. Um, and she uh, she does oil. And we sat down and we had a sketch and and I think you can continue to learn when you when you quit learning you're done. And I've heard a lot of artists say, but what is the best painting you've completed? Well, you're always looking for that next one that you're going to do. Um, so I took her class. I thought, well, I'm going to try oil. Okay. And Dad said, I think that that'd be a good idea. I go down there, got my sketch done, and we're doing uh, what she calls the, the gray stage of the old masters. And I went and bought the book that she re recommended. I'm honestly not a big reader. I'm a, a picture person, and when I was in college, Honestly, I hate to say this on tape, but I, I never read a book openly. I, I'm a scanner, so I'm a note taker, so I'm a quick thinker. I'm a study, visual. And so I had my sketch out, and we're doing this gray stage, and everybody's mixing their paint, and with oil, you're afforded the um, ability to take your time and blend. Well, I grew up in acrylics, and I'm used to, let's get the paint on there. You have your hair dryer right here, and you're drying it, and we're moving on to the next stage. So... This four-hour class, Tracy had done in about 30 minutes, and Sharon come over there, and she's kind of laughing at me. I said, well, what do we do now? She goes, well, Tracy, that has to dry. <laughs> and I said, well, I got three more hours. Well, you know, what do I do? So I didn't take all of her classes. She gave me the cliff notes, and uh, I, to this day, actually, I apply a couple of the techniques that I learned in the oil class. Um, but I do them with acrylic. I've just figured out how to do it with acrylic because my brain and how I was taught or trained or mentored is to work fast. I'm uh, wondering about some of your stylistic shifts. Um, I think one exploration that I thought was really interesting and that happened on the pony was some ledger images mm -hmm. but very stylized I mean they just kind of were you know you could tell they were your mm -hmm. ledger images mm -hmm. um, are you looking are you doing a bit of that too or was that just for that particular project no I've done several um, I've always been fascinated by uh, Plains Indian art always um, And my interest, interest or influence in things that I like ranges, it, it's kind of a strange combination, but I love Japanese art. Carl Bang, love his work. And um, I like plains arts, I love ledger drawing. Um, and, and I guess that's the reason I like Doc Tate's work, because it was so detailed. So no, I, I still continue to do the ledger work. As a matter of fact, I did a, a line, I guess you could say, um, or a time in my career where I did nothing but hand painted purses and big leather wall hangings a lot of people have never seen because I've been really blessed when I was traveling with my dad to to sell mm -hmm. um, so they were selling out of state more oh than, yeah. yeah oh yeah uh, traveling with my dad he threw me into an arena of full-time artists very young and very fast and um, I feel that when you're creating a piece for a competition you need to have the time uh, to sit down, to put your best foot forward, and for me personally, uh, keeping up with my dad's pace uh, from an early age, and traveling and doing as many shows as we had to, to pay the wonderful IRS back for the, those 10 long years. Um, 
I did not have time to sit in a studio and to, and to create pieces for competition. And I forgot your question. I got to rambling. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was just about the, the ledger art. The so, ledger art, right. Yeah. Um, I guess in my art, I've always been a detailed person. So that's what fascinated me about that. So I kind of, I would look at books and different things with the, with the ledger um, artwork on it and kind of put a little contemporary spin on it, um, thinking that, I I don't know, just putting a female, maybe female touch, uh, showing the, the, the male side. I just, I've always enjoyed Plains art. I really have really really have fascinated by it and you, the parfleche designs right. love those yes as a matter of fact on my motorcycle out back <laughs> there's a big ledger piece on the leather <laughs> bag that with the beadwork that you'll have to see <laughs> yeah I, that's I what I chose like to, to put that. on my motorcycle was ledger art <laughs> um, and you also have a line I think of Cherokee clan images mm -hmm. Did, were those all your work, a combination of yours and your dad's, or all your dad's? Let's see, there's several different seven clans seven that clans. we've done, and then we've also done a series of Southeast designs, okay. uh, which your Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, we all kind of claim those uh, pre-Columbian designs. Right. Um, but the seven clans, the ones that we do for our gift line, of coffee mugs and different things that we sell to the museums. I think that first seven clan series, those were dads only. He was commissioned actually by the Boys and Girls Club here locally. Those seven originals hang in their fun game room. Oh. Yeah, here in Pryor. So those seven clans are my dads. Then after that we did, and it, 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 it's funny how, like I said earlier, when you do it full time and you're thinking of how to pay the bills, so it's a bonus uh, being, because you would, as an artist, I think you're going to create anyway, and it's a bonus getting paid. So you find that fine line in between to where you're, you're getting paid, and you're still getting to do what you love, but you, that's where you branch off into different marketing ideas. Um, so the Southeast Designs kind of became popular when the Hard Rock, each of our casinos is themed a certain time period and um, our tribal council which was awesome any building that is built within the Cherokee Nation the 1% fund goes for the purchase of art so um, those uh, hard rock is the pre-Columbian uh, era so those really became popular and a resurgence of those not only in pottery uh, the gorget shell jewelry that that southeast cultures really started to people to, to recognize that so um, that was a whole nother series uh, that we did yeah. together. Yes, yes. What role does sketching play in your work? A little. I, where my dad did maybe on a canvas very little sketching, he may draw the profile in. Me, uh, my process of creating is, a, is different than his because he, and this is my opinion, um, he was just so, he was like five artists in one body. <clears throat> and I used to love to watch him uh, paint because he would go directly from the wet paint here right onto the canvas. Me, my process is, I'm a little, well not a little, my mom says I'm a whole lot more detailed oriented and that's what I always admired about uh, Ben Harjo, Merlin Little Thunder's work is all that detail that they would put in, in, in these pieces. Um, so I sit down, I kind of, depending on what show, what area of the country I'm going to, um, I think that that's always uh, been important. Um, I'll sit down. Usually it takes me about, and my dad never could understand this, but it takes me about two days to unwind. And I would explain to him where he would get to come down to the studio and all he had to do was paint. Me, I'm paying bills, taxes, I'm marketing, I'm getting ads ready, I'm paying booth fees. So your left and right brain, you have to calm that one side down to go to your creative side. So it took me about a day, day and a half to, to come down. When I'm in that zone of creating, then that's when I do a little, not a whole lot of detailed sketch. I just kind of know where I want to put her. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'll, uh, right now I'm enjoying actually, I feel like I've come full circle where I can pick up on a technique that my dad called his sky image or a more of a drippy technique. Mm -hmm. Um, to where there is no sketching involved in that. You're literally working it wet, and how it dries is—it's a fun surprise when it's all done. 
So yeah, very very little. Probably the face, just the mm -hmm. outline. And, and actually, I have a sketch behind you that I could show you. That's that that would be how how it would start. What kinds of research do you do? Depends on the piece. If it's a commission piece, um, a lot of research. The piece uh, behind me that was an era of uh, 1780 to 1830 which is right prior to the uh, removal of the Cherokee people. Um, so for this piece, uh, library, on, of course you have your online access, which is great. So it, it, it depends on the piece, depends on the piece, really. Or if I'm incorporating, say, a different, different tribe, I try not to do anything that is um, that would even I don't even remotely touch say their religious beliefs or something uh, like that. I try to respect all that because I am not knowledgeable in that. But if I had a specific question, I do have friends like Charles Pratt, Cheyenne Arapahoe, that I have asked him questions. Mm -hmm. You know, and that and that's where having that access to very well-known artists has been very valuable to me. Growing up, very valuable. Can you describe your creative process from the time you get an idea? Hmm. If I'm in the zone <laughs> uh, and I'm not having to be at my desk, I'll start there. Um, when I was getting ready for Indian Market, uh, I knew I'm going out to the Southwest. I knew what style of work my dad did and sold well out there, being my first Indian Market. Um, I knew that I wanted to have my women, his technique, my colors, uh, my detail, and it just, that creative process for this show was probably one of the most important shows uh, of building inventory that I've done to date. Um, and I feel like it was received well, I, I sold well, being one of what a thousand artists out there, I was extremely blessed. Paid for my trip, met some great people, um, came back just full of energy. And where it, it's almost when I come home, I just want to get right back to the easel. But yet, it, it is a business, and I have to treat it as such. So you have to continue to do the paperwork side of it. As a matter of fact, I'm doing taxes all this week. <laughs> Sure are. <laughs> so you've sort of described your routine a bit too, your creative routine. Breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that kind of grounds you each day? Each day. Or um, working at I night. Would, as to working I, I would feel my routine has, has changed a lot since the passing of my dad. Um, which is sometimes hard. When, I, when I'm getting ready for a show, the best time for me to work, um, now at our studio we do Monday through Thursday. Fridays is Tracy Day down here by herself uh, to where it's just quiet. Have to have quiet. I prefer the radio music going. I don't necessarily like the TV. Um, so, so when I'm getting ready for a show, when I was getting ready for Indian Market, I knew what I had to do. I was up at 5 and I worked till 11 each night every day to get ready for that show for it was right at about three and a half weeks and it was crunch time um, but right now I'm I'm two individuals I have to keep a business running and we do wholesale markets and we have galleries that call um, stores that call they're placing orders thank goodness you know you know God has blessed our family beyond measure and uh, so that takes up a lot of my time. And so when the next year comes, we're already planning right now uh, new gift items. As a matter of fact, this week I got here at, it's about 5.30 in the morning. So by the time my mom and my cousin uh, get here at nine, I had like this whole list. And I said, I am wired for sound. I've been up since 5.30. And I think that uh, probably my mom would say since maybe <clears throat> March or April of this year, um, you start to feel a little bit <clears throat> getting back into the groove. Mm -hmm. It's been a process. Yeah. 
Well, um, thinking back on your career, what was a pivotal moment when you might have gone down one road, but you took another? You might have touched on it already. I would say the pivotal moment really would have been the IRS because my family needed me. And that was, you know, a lot of things that they were experiencing at the time was things that if, and I don't want to say his name, if Mr. Art Instructor down there, head of the art department, had not um, discouraged me, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. And you think that uh, you're going along your life and you have this great plan laid out ahead of you and uh, kind of get this, uh, somebody hit you from the side and you just change your trajectory of your life and it was not by accident. So I feel that that was probably pivotal, pivotal for me um, whew, and probably the second would be not having him here. Well, um, if you like, we'll pause and take a look at some of your paintings. Okay. Uh, this piece right here is titled Warrior Within. It's a, it's a new original that I just completed, and as I had stated earlier, the creative process, um, on a blank canvas I would sketch her face in, and then I would take uh, the acrylic, or golden fluid acrylic is actually what I prefer to use. I would paint in the background, and then this technique that you see here, mm -hmm. this is all done very fast, very wet. Um, with a brush and once I have on there kind of a general idea of what I like I actually would tilt the canvas in the direction that I want the paint to flow but um, it never dries how it is when you first put it on so it's it's a it's a fun fun deal it's like you're getting a present at the end yeah you like that element of surprise mm -hmm. yes and your signature you want to explain what you do for your signature yes. real quick? Yes, how I, I sign my originals. Uh, my dad would sign his rabbit with the cross above his name with the radiating beams. When I first started uh, painting, I always signed my name Tracy Rabbit. Uh, and then over the years, I have uh, incorporated the cross, his cross as well. So that's how you differentiate our paintings. So how about this piece? This one's titled Sarah's Tea Party. This is actually rep uh, represents uh, a Cherokee home place in Oklahoma. A little girl, this is what I would call a woodland style piece of work uh, with all the detail in the trees, uh, the fine fine detail of her dress, the uh, patchwork quilt. When I was working on this piece, actually, this, this one has not shown a lot. I decided to put the little stuffed rabbit in the chair she was having the tea party with. I love and that. And when my mom seen the rabbit, she confiscated it. So <laughs> a lot of people haven't seen this particular piece, but this one's titled Sarah's Tea Party. This painting is titled Wind Songs. Um, it has a watercolor background technique. Uh, early on in my career, while my, while my dad was still here, he painted at his studio and I uh, would paint in my living room at home in Locust Grove. And when I brought this piece over, he's like, sis, that is just beautiful. How did you get that background? He says, I know how you did it. It's a watercolor technique with uh, acrylic and you've sprinkled salt. He said, but how are you getting all that definition? I said, well, dad, it's, and I, I would tease him, I said, it's a trade secret. But <laughs> I uh, brought a canvas over and I showed him that when you're working it wet and you're applying your color, then your salt, um, if you apply heat, it makes the, the salt grab it faster and the water evaporate faster. So you get these this really neat pulling technique faster where with on watercolor paper, you're gonna get that. But when you're working with canvas, it's not absorbent. So you have to work around the canvas. So I figured out through experimenting with uh, heat, light, different things that I was able to uh, do that. And that was something that I, that I learned on my own. And I was so proud to co come to the studio and he was asking me how I did something. <laughs> <laughs> and you really got some nice texture of beadwork on there too and quill work. I guess. Yeah, and this is part of that. I've always been fascinated. I'm a big collector of beadwork. Uh, so, and again, the, the Plains culture just always admired yeah, yeah a lot of a lot of work, detail in that 
This painting here is uh, another 24 by 36 titled Special Moments. Uh, this was at a time when I was starting to feel like I had done enough work with my own different technique that I could come in and apply, um, as you see, the blanket area here and the swirls, things that my dad was well known for in his work, but have the detail of my faces. And this is actually a picture of myself and my niece. I'm holding my, my brother's little girl, uh, who was only still for about three seconds. <laughs> and so this is actually a transition piece, what I would call a transition piece from the one wind songs mm -hmm. to where I'm starting to incorporate what my dad had taught me with the women. Uh, and of course the long hair that had, was always signature of his work. And I definitely incorporated that into my work because I wanted to be able to keep his legacy and what he taught me alive. And I feel I can do that through my work. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today. You're welcome.